Intel's Ivy Bridge lineup is best remembered for being hotter in Sandy Bridge and only a few percent faster. But if you had one of the more mid-range offerings back then, how would it still do today? Well, the results might actually surprise you. God, I sound so clickbaity. Flanked by the Celerons and Pentiums on the low end, with the Core i5s and hyper-threaded i7s at the high end of the stack, right in the middle of the pack were the Core i3s, the best of those being 3250, but that was pretty much unobtainable for this video. I did, however, manage to get my hands on its slightly slower sibling, the 3240, only slightly slower at 3.4GHz, which is a respectable clock speed for a lower end part, even by today's standards. This was a dual core chip with hyper threading, as the rest of the i3 lineup were. I wouldn't go as far as to say the i3s back then weren't meant for gaming, as you and a number of others watching probably had one, and most likely even tried to game on it. But it was more suited towards those looking for a fast, home office type PC, just one that had a bit more grunt than a Pentium. It doesn't actually seem like almost a decade and a half ago that Sandy Bridge and Ivy Bridge were the new kids on the block. I even had an i5-2500K myself at the time, and intended on using the very same Z68 motherboard I used back then for the review today. But that's unfortunately out of action. I did, however, have an old Fujitsu desktop kicking around, the one you're seeing right now actually, and the one whose second and third gen supporting motherboard I've been building a system on in the background. I'm also using 16 gigabytes of DDR3 RAM at 1600 mega transfers, and my old GTX 1080, just so we can see the absolute maximum that our near teenage i3 has to offer. But that about sums it up for the Ivy Bridge chip, so without further ado, let's get into some gaming benchmarks. Firstly, we have to answer the once serious, but now often just a joke question, can it run Crisis? And yes, yes it can, <laughs> really quite well actually. 1080p with the high preset was almost no issue at all. It did need object and water quality dropped down to low, but those are settings that are extremely intensive even on the latest and greatest CPUs of today. Crisis, the original anyway, not the remaster, was made with only single or dual core CPUs in mind, as this was back when Intel were promising CPUs with 10 GHz plus core clocks. I wonder how that turned out. So it's no surprise really that with a couple of reductions in settings, we're seeing reasonably good performance here in a game that, in my opinion, looks better than its remaster. There are dips to the low 40s FPS wise, and some noticeable stuttering in the absolute most intense scenes, but otherwise it's a smooth 70 to 90 plus FPS experience. So we know the i3 can run Crisis now, and run it real well at that, but what about Skyrim? The original, which released 4 years after Crisis, also runs really, really well, and this is at 1080p with the high preset, high detail settings and FXAA instead of the default anti-aliasing method, as for some reason Skyrim is way too over sharpened by default. I've also installed the official HD texture pack, as well as the unofficial patch for that, so the game not only runs great, but it looks amazing too especially considering Skyrim is even older than the CPU we're actually testing. There are a few minor hitches here and there, with slightly more noticeable ones occurring in places like Bleak Falls Barrow. CPU usage spikes into the 90s here, but performance overall is pretty damn good. So fast forward another 4 years and we got GTA 5. We do start to see the i3 struggle with games of this era. At this point, we're still a couple of years away from AMD's first gen Ryzen CPUs, but games have already started to take advantage of CPUs with 4 physical cores now, so the i3 with its 2 hyper-threaded cores is getting left behind. It really does still run relatively well considering that though. I mean, with very high textures but everything else on normal at 1080p, we're averaging nearly 60fps here, generally sitting around the mid-40s. Bear in mind as well that the PS3 and Xbox 360s at the time could barely manage 30fps at 720p. I won't lie though, there were moments of noticeable stuttering, with a slight amount noticeable throughout, but here we are, running GTA 5 at a far greater than current, at the time, console performance, all the while pulling very little power, because you might have noticed by now from the overlay 
that the i3 has rarely, if ever, gone over 20 watts. So, first off, it can run CS2, just not very well at all. CS2 completely replaced their original Counter-Strike Go in late 2023, and since then, Valve have also removed the ability to even play on the last remaining community-run servers as well, thus forever banishing CSGO from existence. Which is a shame, really, as the i3 would probably have run that just fine. But CS2 really does just struggle. Heavier maps like Anubis, even lighter maps like Mirage actually, can have really noticeable stuttering. Stuttering to the point that it's often quite hard to actually aim at the enemies in front of you, which is kind of important in a game where you're trying to kill the other players before they kill you. Even playing against the bots was hard, he says, pretending he doesn't normally have trouble with the bots. We are now 11 years on from the i3's original release though, so it shouldn't be a surprise that big name games from the 2020s are really struggling on our power sipping dual core friend here. But gaming obviously isn't the only thing you use a CPU for, so what is it like to actually use on a daily basis? Well, from my limited testing, as I don't actually use these systems outside of benchmarking, it all seems reasonably fast and quite pleasant to use. I had no issues using LibreOffice, and even 4K60 YouTube was fine too. Yeah, that's right, our little dual core friend here can manage YouTube content in 4K without dropping any frames whatsoever. Granted, the GPU is doing most of the grunt work here, but it goes to show as long as you have at least a semi-recent graphics card capable of decoding 4K content, even an old i3 is enough. Where it does start to show its age though is with multitasking. Things do get a bit sluggish. You're bound to notice little slowdowns here and there though, because as I said before, this is a now 12 year old dual core chip and things have moved on a lot since then. So in conclusion then, as you've probably gathered from how enthusiastic I've been about the 3240, I am pretty bloody impressed with what it still has to offer. It is more than adequate for use in home office and media center PCs and even has enough gaming performance to blow the current, at the time, games consoles out of the water. All the while pulling no more than 20 watts at worst, and barely breaking 40 degrees celsius while doing it. But that about does it for today, so for now, I've been Seven Tests, and thanks for watching my video. Goodbye. So first of all, if you've made it to this part of the video, then I really, really appreciate you actually watching all of my content. I also really appreciate these people here for supporting me on Patreon, which you can also do by following the Patreon link in the description down below. If you enjoyed this content, I'd absolutely love and really appreciate a like and subscribe to the channel. And if you'd like to see more of that content, you can check out this video there, or even this video down there as well. But yeah, that's going to be all for today, so hopefully you enjoyed my content and hopefully I'll see you in the next one.